Chapter 1. The topic of pregnancy is one filled with lots of unproven and baseless practices. Pregnancy medical care can be a handful. It's a lot like being a child again. There's always someone telling you what to do with your diet, your weight, and the kinds of pills you use. All these rules frustrated Emily Oster when she had her first pregnancy. It didn't make sense to her how pregnancy was treated as a one-size-fits-all affair. Pregnant women are rarely allowed to make decisions, and even on the few occasions they are asked to, it turns out to be only an appearance. The decision has been made already by the doctor. Not long into her pregnancy, Emily Oster began to come up with questions. She had to create her own framework so as to structure the decisions on her own. But to do this, she needed actual data. The sum of Emily Oster's study is that pregnancy suffers from a lot of misinformation. One or two weak studies have been made to be conventional wisdom. A woman's pregnancy journey would be so much easier if she didn't have to follow specific recommendations all the way. And so, having delved into deep research on pregnancy... She came up with renewed knowledge on the topic. Chapter 2. Conception is the first stage in motherhood filled with some wrong teachings. When it comes to pregnancy and fertility, many women worry about aging because of the common notion that the older you are, the less fertile you become. But the fact is, starting pretty much the first day you menstruate, your fertility is declining. Your most fertile time is in your teens, and then it goes down from there. 30 is worse than 20, and 40 is worse than 30. As a matter of fact, 35 is the deadline. However, the truth is, the reduction of fertility isn't as dramatic as it sounds. While it's true that it's harder to get pregnant when you are older, it isn't impossible. It would help many women to stop worrying about age, but rather start wondering about the things they can do to prepare. It is also advisable to be in good physical shape before pregnancy because studies have proven that obese women have a higher risk for complications than normal weight women. However, you don't have a problem if you can't lose that last five pounds. The issues here are a result of pretty vast differences in weight, so don't worry too much about a few pounds here and there, but if you are significantly overweight, you should look into trimming down before pregnancy. Conception is a big issue for women. When it comes to conception, it's not as it's generally sold. The key issue is timing. You need sperm to be around at the exact moment the egg is ready. Pregnancy rates are high if you have sex on the day of ovulation or the day before. It's possible to get pregnant by having sex as many as five days before ovulation, but it's a lot less likely. After you ovulate, forget it until next month. You'll have to wait through the second half of the month. Many women respect this two-week wait period. They act as though they're pregnant, no caffeine, no alcohol. This is a waste, though, because assuming you did conceive, your behavior during those two weeks would have no impact on your baby. Interestingly, unhealthy behavior during the first two-week wait could affect your chance of conception but won't affect the baby if you do conceive. Did you know? Early pregnancy tests can detect pregnancy four or even five days before your missed period, but pregnancy loss is common in this time frame. Chapter 3 while tobacco should be avoided during pregnancy, alcohol and caffeine are allowed in small amounts. Just like everybody, pregnant women are capable of making decisions for themselves. However, it does seem like gynecologists don't see it that way. Instead, they find it easier to manipulate their beliefs so they can do the right thing. There are just too many restrictions, like not drinking wine and avoiding caffeine. Many women seem to think that when they drink, that glass of wine is channeled directly to the fetus. People correctly note that you would not give your infant a glass of wine, so why would you give your fetus one? Needless to say, this is not really how it works. Emily Oster, Ph.D. There is no question that heavy drinking during pregnancy is harmful to your baby. 
Women who report binge drinking during pregnancy, more than five drinks at a time, are more likely to have children with severe cognitive defects. In one Australian study, women who binged in the second or third trimesters were 15 to 20 percent more likely to have children with language delays than women who didn't drink. This is emphasized in other studies. Binge or heavy drinking in the first trimester can cause physical deformities and in the later trimesters, cognitive problems. If you are binge drinking, stop. However, this does not directly imply that light or occasional drinking is a problem. There is no credible evidence that light drinking during pregnancy can have any impact on your baby's cognitive development. Therefore, you can indulge in up to one drink per day in the second and third trimesters and one to two drinks per week in the first trimester. You should completely avoid vodka shots, though. Another common statement that comes up in advice to pregnant women is, don't take caffeine. The big concern with caffeine in pregnancy is that it might lead to higher rates of miscarriage. Caffeine can cross the placenta, and it's not clear how the fetus processes it. In addition, researchers have speculated that caffeine can inhibit fetal development by limiting blood flow to the placenta. However, studies show that about two cups of coffee a day is safe, so in moderation, coffee is fine. Besides refraining from alcohol and coffee, pregnant women are also urged to stay away from tobacco. If you smoke, your doctor will outrightly advise you to quit. The exact science of why smoking matters is not completely clear, but we have some ideas. Tobacco contains a number of chemicals, but the two important ones are nicotine and carbon monoxide. Both of these restrict oxygen to the fetus, and less oxygen means less growth. Additionally, the blood vessel constriction caused by nicotine exposure can damage the placenta, which is the source of many pregnancy complications. No, there is no window out of this one. Smoking is indeed harmful to your baby, just as it is bad for you. Chapter 4. Make the right nutrition decisions to ensure your baby's health. In trying to learn the truth about alcohol, and in particular caffeine, it is hard to avoid the question of miscarriage. Increased risk of miscarriage is the major concern regarding excess caffeine consumption. However, that isn't the only cause of miscarriage. Many pregnancies are lost before ultrasound within the first five weeks. And even after an ultrasound, there are still risks of loss. Some factors that may raise or lower your personal risk reflective to the average individual are your previous history of miscarriage. Having had one miscarriage, you are somewhat likely to have another. This may seem scary, but it is important to remember that the vast majority of women who miscarry go on to have successful pregnancies. Age. Older women are more likely to miscarry due to a higher rate of chromosomal problems. In one study, the miscarriage rate was 4.4% for women under 20, 6.7% for women 20 to 35, and almost 19% for women over 35. Circumstances surrounding the conception. Pregnancies achieved via IVF seem to most likely end in miscarriages. One study reported a miscarriage rate of 30% for in vitro fertilization, IVF, pregnancies versus 19% for those achieved naturally. In addition to these pre pregnancy risk factors, vaginal bleeding and lack of nausea are symptoms during early pregnancy that correlate with miscarriage. You might wonder if there is something you can do to avoid miscarriage. The answer is probably not. As most pregnancy losses at this point are due to chromosomal problems and those are determined at fertilization, it is out of your control. However, the health of your unborn baby is to some extent up to you. That explains why your doctors handed you a list of do's and don'ts as soon as you were confirmed pregnant. Besides alcohol, caffeine, and tobacco, the do not consume list includes food, hot dogs, raw oysters, deli meat, lox, rare steak, sushi, and so on, even tuna. This food restriction can be challenging as most pregnant women develop some sort of insatiable craving for them. Did you know? 
By 22 or 23 weeks, some babies can actually survive out of the womb. Chapter 5. A woman's weight during pregnancy has an impact on the size of her baby. Every pregnant woman's concern is weight gain. Women who spend their whole lives dieting and watching every calorie arrive at pregnancy thinking it's the one time they can just eat with abandon. And then reality sets in. Not only is the amount you are supposed to gain restricted, but someone is literally monitoring and commenting on your weight every couple of weeks. The first concern about weight gain is that if you put it on, you have to take it off and in the long run, being overweight is bad for your health. It is true that many women do have trouble losing weight after pregnancy and wind up retaining at least a few of those pregnancy pounds. The good news is that this might be short-lived, at least for most women. A more recent study found that 90% of women who started out at a normal weight had returned to a normal weight range by 24 months postpartum, regardless of how much weight they had gained during pregnancy. Regarding the child's weight, there is a possibility that conditions in the womb contribute to childhood obesity. There is no question that obesity among young people has increased. It is possible that higher rates of maternal weight gain during pregnancy have contributed to this increase. So, by eating those extra pancakes, you might be dooming your child to a lifetime of dieting. The biological mechanism that makes this work is called insulin resistance. It is believed that excess weight gain during pregnancy could stimulate the fetus to produce more insulin, resulting in higher birth weight limited sugar tolerance, and later weight gain. On average, if you gain more weight, your baby will be larger, but if you gain less weight, your baby will be smaller. Don't overly push yourself to lose weight to avoid having an overweight baby. If anything, you should be more concerned about gaining too little weight because while both large and small babies face additional risks, two small babies face a much greater risk. Chapter 6 At one point or another, every woman worries about going into labor too early. A premature birth is one that occurs between 22 and 36 weeks of pregnancy. The fact that this starts at 22 weeks is pretty incredible. As late as the 1960s, babies born even a few weeks premature frequently died. However, things have changed. 98% of babies born at that gestational age and weight survived through their first year. Many of the advances in survival have been due to improvements in assisted ventilation. The lungs are among the last organs to develop, so babies born as late as 36 weeks can have serious trouble breathing. Until the baby is able to breathe on its own, mechanical breathing machines can be used. This and other advancements have led to significant improvements in the survival of late-term infants, those born between 34 and 36 weeks, and also increases the ability to save babies born even at 22 to 23 weeks of gestation. Despite the high chance of survival of preterm babies, it is still better not to have your baby prematurely because prematurity, especially extreme, does have some long-term impacts. Babies born prematurely are more likely to suffer illnesses as children, have lower IQs on average, and often have vision or hearing problems. To avoid preterm labor, bed rest is usually prescribed. It is one solution that is appealing, at least in part because it seems so logical. It seems that lying down and stopping things from jostling around so much will help the baby stay inside. At least it seems to work out for those who try it. Many women who are put on bed rest go on to carry their babies to term, but that is not clear evidence because it can't be known what would have happened if those women had engaged in normal activities. In fact, there is no compelling evidence to suggest that bed rest is effective in preventing preterm labor, so avoid it. You're soon going to stop worrying about having a premature baby. When you do, you'll almost immediately switch to being concerned about the baby not arriving. When you're close to your due date, you'll be so uncomfortable that you'll be less afraid of labor. But if it's any consolation, know for sure that no one has ever been pregnant forever. 
The majority of babies arrive within a week on either side of their due dates. Chapter 7. Albeit short, labor is unarguably the most delicate part of pregnancy. Compared to the total pregnancy, labor is relatively short, yet it occupies an outsized percentage of attention. You can see why, of course. Labor is definitely the most medical part of pregnancy. It involves a huge number of decisions by you and your doctor, and it's, frankly, a little scary. Labor occurs in three stages. At the start, your baby is still in the uterus, and the cervix at the bottom is closed. By the end, both the baby and the placenta are out, and the uterus is starting to contract back to its normal size. The following are the stages of labor. Dilation. In this stage, your cervix goes from closed to 10 centimeters open. This stage is by far the longest. It can, in principle, last for days. Dilation itself is divided into three parts, early labor, active labor, and transition. Early labor is the period where you go from a closed cervix to about 3 centimeters. This stage of labor tends to be comparatively easy, with mild and fairly infrequent contractions. Many women go through at least some of this stage of labor over a period of days or even weeks, often without knowing it. After this, you move into active labor, which is more intense and typically impossible to ignore. During this period, the cervix dilates from 3 to 7 centimeters. Active labor can be slow or fast, depending on the woman, and usually involves more frequent contractions. The final part of the first stage is called transition and is the period in which the cervix completes the dilation from 7 to 10 centimeters. For most women, this is the most difficult period of labor, albeit the shortest. Pushing. This stage tends to be shorter, although there is a lot of variation. It can be as short as a few minutes, standard in cases of recurring moms, or as long as a few hours. This stage ends when the baby arrives. You might think that this means you are done, but after the baby is born, there's still some work to do. Placenta. This step typically occurs immediately after the baby comes out, and with all the excitement and hormones, it can be a bit of a blur. It can also be surprisingly painful. The doctor will sometimes push on your stomach to get the placenta out, but it's usually over in no time. Sometimes labor doesn't go smoothly. This can happen when dilation is too slow or stops altogether. Baby gets stuck. Baby is facing the wrong way, making it harder to push. When such delivery problems occur, a C-section is performed. Having the option to have a C-section if things go wrong is great, and C-sections are generally safe and common. However, they are not the preferred mode of delivery primarily because recovery from a C-section is generally slower than that of a vaginal delivery. So a C-section should not be your first choice unless your baby is breached or you've had the procedure done before. Conclusion Pregnancy isn't the same for all women. Starting from the very beginning, some find out they're pregnant quite early, while it comes as a surprise for others. Different women have different symptoms and sickness during their pregnancies, so it is important that you understand your body. In fact, it is possible that a woman can go through different symptoms for each pregnancy. For example, the first pregnancy might not be similar to the second or third, as the case may be. Now that you've gone through the stages expectant mothers go through in this summary, you should be fully equipped and ready to birth your own baby. Having debunked the many myths and hyperboles surrounding pregnancy, you are not just a clueless woman with a growing round ball. Hopefully, you can now make proper decisions to ensure the well-being of your child. You know what and what not to indulge in. You are well aware of the importance of your nutrition choices. There are some medications pregnant women are advised not to take, so it is important that you always seek the advice of your doctor and not self-medicate. You also know that when it comes to some aspects, miscarriage, for example, there is very little you can do. So relax, seek more knowledge on your journey, and calmly expect your little bundle of joy. Your fertility begins to decline from the first day you menstruate, 
This means that you are more fertile in your teenage years. Emily Oster, Ph.D. Try this. Surround yourself with good energy throughout your pregnancy. Maintain a cheery mood by staying positive and listening to uplifting music. It sure will help that wonderful baby in there.